Explore today's must-have trends and innovative styles at Mrs. B's Clearance and Outlet. Shop one-of-a-kind finds in today's must-have trends. Explore wall-to-wall deals, furniture, flooring, mattresses, home accents, seasonal favorites, and more. Discover unique new home decor, pillows, accessories, and more. There's something perfect for your style and budget. There's new inventory every day at up to 80% off suggested retail. Discover the style and savings of Mrs. B's Clearance and Outlet. Ameristar Council Bluffs was voted best casino in the area for a reason. You'll find more than 1,200 slots and a variety of table games, all available 24-7. We have multiple restaurants, including a buffet, with all-you-can-eat crab legs on Fridays, prime rib on Saturdays, and brunch on Sundays. An action-packed sports bar and a sports book with the best odds in town. Your best bet for entertainment is Ameristar Council Bluffs. Must be 21 to enter casino. Terms subject to change. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-BETS-OFF. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me as always, yes, he's the pirate pilot of this ship. Here is the captain. Arr, mateys. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Today we are featuring and sipping on a fantastic beer called Revenge of the Muffin Man from the good folks at Susquehanna Brewing Company. This is a mighty ale brewed with blueberries. This beer is sweet and strong, an absolute brilliant and beautiful color, so pour a little out for your homies and very cool can art as well. ABV 8.5% garage grade, three and three quarter bottle caps out of five. And let's give some thanks and praise to our friends that helped us fill up the old garage fridge for this week's show. First up, a shout out to Christy Hiller in Irwin, Pennsylvania. And a big we like to jib to Molly Nichols in Rockton, Illinois. And last but certainly not least, we have Beth in Versailles, Kentucky. Everyone we just mentioned, they went to truecrimegarage.com, clicked on the pint glass, and donated to this week's beer fund. And for that, well, we thank you. Yeah, B W E W R U N beer run. If you need more True Crime Garage for your earballs, make sure you follow us on Patreon and Apple subscription. And Colonel, that's enough of the beers, Nias. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. January 1994, the small town of South Shore, Kentucky, in the immediate surrounding areas, had only experienced a total of four homicides in the previous five years. Not a bad run for the sleepy communities in Greenup County. The town of South Shore is one of the very northernmost points in the state of Kentucky, but the name is far from strange. In fact, it is spot on, considering the town sits on the south shore of the Great Ohio River. Back in January of 94, the small town had a population of about 1,300 people, and as stated, only four homicides in the five years, and this included surrounding areas. But in January of 1994, South Shore PD would catch two more. The first was that of 20-year-old Michelle Craddock. Her boyfriend, Robert Scott Robinson, drove the unconscious Michelle Craddock to the hospital, saying that there had been an accident. There, vigilant hospital workers notified police. Their suspicion was that the young woman had been beaten nearly to death. Police quickly pieced together that she had in fact been attacked by the boyfriend at their home that they had shared together for just four months. Sadly, Michelle passed away at King's Daughters Medical Center just days later. 
Robinson was later convicted for the murder and sentenced by a jury of his peers. But then just days after Robinson drove his girlfriend to the hospital, and several months before his conviction, a body was discovered. This time, it was a body that someone left in the snow. This is a murder so cold, the unsolved murder of Evelyn Fleck. And this is True Crime Garage. We are going back to 1994. We have a true crime story for you this week that depending on who you speak with, this homicide case is varying degrees of cold. Some might tell you that it's frigid. Others telling us that it's active and they are just one step away from finally making an arrest. But it starts with a body that is discovered outside in the cold. This is during a time when northern Kentucky was hit with blizzard-like conditions. We're going to the morning of January 21st, 1994, when a man is out walking his dog and notices that a neighbor's door to their home is left wide open. So this neighbor decides to investigate. Upon further review, this person finds a body in the backyard of this neighboring property. Now, it may seem strange to some for a neighbor to investigate just seeing a door left open. We've all left doors open to carry in items or maybe by mistake. But in this situation, we have frigid temperatures. So this area is just coming out of blizzard-like conditions for about a week's time. This area of the country experienced snow, ice, and sub-zero temperatures. In fact, nine people had died during the course of this week. So what we have here is a concerned neighbor sees that a door is left open in a situation where people are passing because of the weather conditions and looking to just check in and be neighborly and finds a body in the backyard of his neighbor's home. Well, and also locals reported that this neighbor was really fond of the phrase, What, were you born in a barn? The South Shore Kentucky Police Department and Emergency Services gets the call. Now, initially when they get the call, the call comes in, they're kind of under the assumption that the person that they will be responding to had likely froze to death. However, shortly after arriving on the scene, it's quickly determined that this is, in fact, the homicide that they're responding to. That is because... The person that they find is out in the snow, but this poor woman is found in the backyard with a refrigerator on top of her. This is from the Lexington Herald. A South Shore woman was found dead beneath a refrigerator in her backyard, marking the second violent death in South Shore area in a week. A neighbor found the nude body of Evelyn Louise Fleck at her Main Street house. Greenup County Coroner Robert Green said he had not yet determined the cause of death. We should also note here, Captain, that Fleck also had a lawn chair on top of her as well. This is stated by the police. This situation, she's found nude, and unfortunately we have multiple sources that are telling us some vaguely different information. So some of the information we get states that she was actually found on the back porch of the home and other sources saying she was in the backyard. Either way, we've narrowed down the general location of where she was found. The refrigerator that was found on top of her is always referred to as an old refrigerator. So this was just an old junk refrigerator that I'm guessing whoever perpetrated this homicide didn't need to move that refrigerator very far. It may have already been on the back porch of that home waiting to be disposed of. And the perp tossed this onto her, hoping to possibly conceal the body. Well, that's the question, right? (laughs) You have a dead body. You have a refrigerator on top. You have a lawn chair on top. Is this to 
hide the body, conceal the body, or is this just to, de- to destroy the victim? Yes, a, a maniac who's just furthering the the damage done. Yeah. She's going to be covered in snow, too. We talked about the weather conditions in this area, but we've also reviewed some cases where somebody tried to conceal a body in the trunk of a vehicle, and that vehicle sat outside for an extended period of time. Now, while trying to conceal the body, what in fact they did was protect physical evidence. So when we sit here today and review a case that, again, varying degrees of cold, depending on who you talk to, is now 30 years old, and we live in the golden age of solving crimes via DNA and physical evidence, I'm hoping that if this person thought that they could conceal the body by tossing this refrigerator, pushing it over on top of this poor woman, that I hope it protected some of the physical evidence from the elements that evening. And we'll go back in time to create a timeline here on when we think the actual homicide took place. Well, I think you have a good point there. Could these items protect some of the DNA left on the victim or was there DNA left on these items when they were being thrown onto the victim? And with the victim being found nude under the refrigerator, you have to then wonder if a sexual assault took place. And if it did, that is where we might be able to solve this case all these years later. I like your definition of this perpetrator of the murder, a maniac. It's a word that we probably don't use enough in true crime. South Shore is a smaller community, about 1,300 people in the early 90s populated the town. So if you're police and you're responding to a call and it's a homicide, the protocol is going to be to call in Kentucky State Police, KSP. South Shore Police Chief Jerry Cassidy notifies KSP, and they are on the scene rather quickly. This is the Ashland Post that's responding. They are the post which covers Boyd, Carter, Greenup, and Lawrence counties in the great state of Kentucky. The Ashland Post was one of the highest solve rates of any of the KSP detachments, thanks to the good work of numerous outstanding detectives who have been assigned to the post over the years. So a high clearance rate for homicides by this post. So if you have somebody investigating, you want experienced investigators, South Shore PD does not have that. KSP does, and they're on the scene. For this case, Captain, we get Detective Runyon will be in charge and the lead investigator early on in this investigation. The victim is 37-year-old Evelyn Louise Fleck. That is her married name, and Evelyn is, in fact, the homeowner. So she is found in the backyard of her property, of her home. The detective determined that some type of weapon was used in the attack. I'm guessing that it was not found at the scene, as the police report that we have does not define what type of weapon was used. So therefore, it's suggestive that they did not locate this weapon. The Greenup County Coroner within a couple days, ruled this a homicide. The information that we get is Evelyn Fleck was strangled either in the evening or during the night of January 20th, 1994, while she was in bed. Do they know if she was strangled with an object or was she strangled by this murderer's hands? I'm guessing hands here. So the autopsy was requested for our putting this show together, but it, that request was denied. So the only information we get about injuries to our victim come from the limited information that they discussed openly to the papers back then. So she's found in the morning of the 21st. We have the coroner who's saying that she was strangled in bed. Again, Captain brings up a good point here because We know that other injuries suggest that she was beaten as well. The police report says that a weapon was used in this attack. Was it for the strangulation or was it for the attack on the woman, the physical attack before the strangulation? 
The reason why I say that I think that we are dealing with someone using their hands in the strangulation here, Captain, is because it was not obvious to the detective at the scene. He had to rely on the coroner's report a couple days later to make that determination. So time of death here is somewhat uncertain. It's a little ambiguous. Interestingly enough, the detective notes on the police report that the incident occurred between the hours of 2000 on Thursday, January 20th, to 1015 a.m. Friday, January 21st. I'm guessing here, though, Captain, as the info on this was and has been kept sealed with a very tight lid for for now anyway, but someone must be able to account for Evelyn at 8 p.m. the night before, and then she is found at 10.15 a.m. the next morning. So that is our window to deal with. Well, and the problem with that window is it's a large window. It's a large window. She went by the name Evie Lou, by the way. Now, we can't be 100% certain here, but I think we can squeeze the window on that time a little bit if we try. We found a source that says someone spoke with Evie Lou via her home phone, and they don't have a certain, they're not 100% certain about the time that they spoke on the phone. But at that time, she's alive and well. She's not in trouble. She doesn't say anything's wrong or that she's in fear. But this person says that she believes that this phone call took place somewhere maybe between 7 and 8 p.m. the night before she was found. During that conversation, Evie says to this person that she was going to be watching a movie that night, and in fact the movie was coming on and she needed to get off of the phone, and that they could continue their conversation after the movie. Evie Lou doesn't call back, does not call this person back after the movie. So it would seem likely that she doesn't call back because she is already in trouble by this point, either having already been killed or she is unable to make this phone call. Well, I think this is fascinating, right? 1994, so it's a TV movie. Do we, do we know what the movie was? Well, it's, it's, it would have been a movie. It was a movie that was in movie theaters, but of course she's watching it on TV that night. So Evie Lou tells the person on the phone that she will be watching a coal miner's daughter that night. So this is 1994. That movie came out in 1980. And I went back and I was able to find the TV listings for that night and what time this movie would have been on. So It was on TBS Channel 7 in that area. It came on at 8 p.m., and it ended at 10.30 p.m. So this would make a lot of sense, right? Because we have her friend, this person on the phone that says, yeah, I can't pinpoint exactly what time we had our call, but I believe it was 7 o'clock, maybe even 8 p.m. the night before she was found. And she did say, oh, I'm going to watch this movie. In fact, I got to get off the phone because it's, it's getting ready to come on. So... She's probably on the phone with this person, 745, close to 8 o'clock. And then two and a half hours later, when the movie ended, she does not call back as promised. That doesn't mean 100% that something happened to Evie Lou before 1030. But I believe it to be suggestive that whatever happened to her or she was in a state for whatever reason that she could not call back when that movie ended at 1030 p.m. Shout out to Sissy Spacek for winning the Oscar for A Coal Miner's Daughter. Well, it's definitely a logical possibility. It's very interesting, though, too, because a lot of these cases were able to talk to people close to the case. And so other than the strangulation, do we have any known injuries to the victim? Yes. And again, the reports vary, but they're very similar. So I feel like there's a lot of accuracy here. Uh, Some sources say that she sustained three, possibly three blows to the head and face area, while other reports say that she had injuries to her neck and shoulders. And again, this would have been a physical attack. This She had been beaten, but where you get some optimism here, 
right? You got to look for when you when you're investigating this case, you got to look for what's where's our potential evidence hiding. What is the victim telling us? What are the injuries telling us? Well, even from afar, when we see that there was an actual physical attack before the strangulation took place, you hope and pray that Evie Lou had a chance to fight back and that she fought back like a wildcat. And maybe she scratched this person. Maybe she, maybe she grabbed at his face or grabbed at uh, his arms, forearms, trying to get those hands off of her neck. And again, that gives us some hope that we could have that physical scientific evidence that will point directly to our perpetrator or perpetrators. Interestingly enough, though, we have the coroner and the investigator, while they're not willing to give up a whole lot of details and information that they know about the crime, they do openly say that the attack took place. It's either started and or ended in that bed. So they must have blood evidence to suggest this is where the attack took place. There's no other blood evidence around that house on the inside of that house to suggest that there was an altercation anywhere else. And again, the being found in the nude could be mean multiple scenarios. Either she was just simply sleeping in the nude when the attack took place, or there was a sexual assault. Or this was a way for the perpetrator to further humiliate the victim once she would be found. Whoever did this knew 100% that this woman would be found eventually. She's literally feet from the inside of her home. But this person is a maniac. It doesn't make a lot of sense. You have this attack that took place in the bedroom, on the bed victim's dead why move the victim and then when you go to move the victim did they change plans was did they think well if 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 i put them outside that this will just look like an accident i mean none of this really makes a lot of sense to me and you know why i think it doesn't make any sense is i think our perpetrator or perpetrators panicked i think they panicked i think that that this was an act that was mostly rage filled and that they panicked after the fact. So the other injuries, there were some bruising on the shoulders and thighs. And then there were, there was a lot of scrapes on the feet. And when I hear the statement from the coroner that the attack started and or ended in the bed, and then you get the description of scrapes and cuts on the feet That tells me that I think we're looking at one person. I think that that he killed her in the bed, and I think you're getting the scrapes on the feet because he did his damnedest to try to drag her outside so he could move that body and place it far away from that house. But something happened when he opened up that door, and instead he left her laying there right by that back door. Do you want to set your child up for success? Of course you do. That's why you need to check out IXL Learning today. IXL Learning is an online learning program for kids covering math, language arts, science, and social studies. IXL is designed to help them really understand and master topics in a fun way. It's powered by advanced algorithms. IXL gives the right help to each kid no matter the age or or personality. There's one site for all kids in your home pre-K to 12th grade. Kids could use it at home on their computer or on an app on your phone or a tablet. No more grading those worksheets. IXL grades everything for you. One in four students in the U.S. are learning with IXL. IXL is used in 95 of the top 100 school districts in the U.S. I love recommending IXL learning. Kids can learn at home or on the go. And all my friends and family that are using it absolutely love it because it's so easy to set up and so easy to use. 
And even the kids that I've recommended it to their parents have told me, hey, Captain, thank you. I was having problems in math and my parents couldn't help me, but IXL could. Do you want to get your kids back on track or do you just want to get your kids ahead? Do so with IXL Learning. Make an impact on your child's learning. Get IXL now. And True Crime Garage listeners get an exclusive 20% off IXL membership when you sign up today at IXL.com slash garage. Visit IXL.com slash garage to get the most effective learning program out there at the best price. Check out IXL.com slash garage today. The best part of spring cleaning takeaway is the post-clean clarity you get. It's kind of like when you find out that you've been paying a fortune for wireless when Mint Mobile has phone plans for $15 a month when you purchase a three-month plan. It's time to switch to Mint Mobile. All plans come with high-speed data and unlimited talk and text delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and bring your phone number along with all of your existing contacts. Ditch overpriced wireless with Mint Mobile's limited time deal and get three months of premium wireless service for 15 bucks a month. Think about all of the money, how much money you will be saving by switching to this amazing, brilliant plan that is delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. That's high-speed data, unlimited talk and text, all from Mint Mobile. To get this new customer offer and your new three-month unlimited wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month, go to mintmobile.com slash TCG. That's mintmobile.com slash TCG. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash TCG. $45 upfront payment required, equivalent to $15 a month. New customers on first three-month plan only. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes on unlimited plan. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. Warmer, sunnier days are calling. Fuel up for them with factors, no prep, no mess meals. Meet your wellness goals in time for summer thanks to the menu of chef-crafted meals with options like Calorie Smart, Protein Plus, and Keto. Factors Fresh, never frozen meals are dietitian approved and ready to eat in just two minutes. So no matter how busy you are, you'll always have time to enjoy nutritious, great-tasting meals. With 35 different meals and more than 60 add-ons to choose from every week, you'll always have new flavors to explore and crush your wellness goals this May with dietitian approved meals and ingredients that you can trust. Make your day delicious from breakfast to dessert. Stay fueled with easy, nutritious options and treat yourself to restaurant quality meals that feature premium ingredients like filet mignon, shrimp, and blackened salmon. I have changed my lunch game 100% with factor meals. Lunch was always a problem for me. I never have enough time in my busy schedule and work day for a good, great tasting, and more importantly, nutritious lunch. And now I am getting a great tasting, nutritious lunch every day, dietitian approved with ingredients that I can trust, and I'm loving the meal options. Jalapeno lime cheddar chicken is my current favorite. And for lunch today, I had the spicy Poblano beef bowl. You're going to love the Factor meals, and you're going to love the time that you save as well. Head to factormeals.com slash truecrimegarage50 and use code truecrimegarage50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month. That's code truecrimegarage50 and factormeals.com slash truecrimegarage50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month while your subscription is active. All right, we are back. Cheers, mates. Cheers to the people in the front. Tall cans in the air. And just a quick reminder... 
that Nick and the captain, me, the captain, will be sailing our dinghy all the way over to the UK for CrimeCon UK 2024 in London. So please join us. Cheers to you, Colonel. That will be in September, and we are very much looking forward to it. Cheers to you, Captain. Cheers to everyone out there. This case, again, varying degrees of cold. The Kentucky State Police are rather adamant that they have a case here, that they've collected a lot of evidence over the years, and this is coming from a lot of this stemming from early interviews that were conducted and possible witnesses, not necessarily witnesses to the murder. We're not talking eyewitnesses here or ear witnesses. We're talking about persons that just have some information about our victim and about potential suspects that really starts to close the gap in on persons that we should be looking at. So let's talk about the victim here. So Evie Lou, as we said, she was the homeowner. And, I, and I'm really kind of underlining that for the listeners with purpose because she had been married twice by the time of her murder. Her first husband had moved away and they had a daughter together, just one child. He had moved to another state and this man was a long haul trucker and the daughter went with him. Now, the daughter would come back to visit mom on occasion. I would imagine probably holidays and summertime. So they still maintained a good relationship together. And from my understanding, Captain, the divorce took place when the daughter was roughly 10, 11. And the murder took place when the daughter was about 16. So we have a considerable amount of time that... Evie Lou and her first husband had been separated. Well, no indication that they were having issues with co-parenting or no issues as far as child custody was concerned. To 99% of the people out there, that is correct. The person that would say otherwise would be Evie Lou's second husband. Their separation is confusing to me. It's confusing to law enforcement and it's confusing to her relatives. Okay. So there, depending on who you talk to or what source you get your information from, some sources even say that she was legally divorced from her second husband. Most sources say, no, that's not true. So we have sources that say, look, they were, they had been on the outs for months. The official report states that they had been separated for five days. Five days. Not a lot of time. No. My guess here is that a lot of this information can all be true with the exception of the divorce. I think these two had been on the outs for several weeks, if not months, but it was only five days or six days prior that Evie Lou told her second husband to leave the house. You can no longer stay here. And that's the cause for the discrepancy where some people are citing the he's outdoors. Well, they're no longer together. Her second husband at the time was staying at his mother's house, which would be roughly about a 10 minute drive or so from Evie Lou's house. Well, when we have a crime like this, when we have a murder victim, obviously law enforcement is going to start asking people, is there somebody out there that would want to harm her? Is there somebody out there that would want to harm this victim? And, But I do find it a little strange when people start pointing the finger in multiple directions right away. It's almost indicative of, hey, don't look at me. I'm the good guy. You might want to look at uh, maybe her first husband, or you might want to look at the neighbor. You might want to look anywhere but me. And from my understanding here, Captain, we have the current husband, His name is Jerry Fleck. So Evelyn Louise Fleck, that's her married name. She was born Evelyn Louise Pack. She was married to a Mr. Nichols. That's who she had her daughter with. And daughter was living with Mr. Nichols in another state at the time of the murder. I've been told by multiple sources that the, there was a confirmed alibi for her first husband. 
that he was out of state. He wasn't even in the state of Kentucky that they had verified that he was in another state at the time of the murder. Her second husband, Jerry Fleck, as we said, living or staying, however you want to describe it, at his mother's place, about a 10-minute drive away from where Evie Lou was staying. And again, she was the homeowner, and we know that because after she was killed, that home stayed in the family, her family. And in fact, it was offered to was offered to somebody in the family and the family member said, yeah, I don't want to move in there where a loved one was murdered inside that house. So what was Jerry, Jerry Dingleberry's alibi for the night? His alibi was that he had last seen Evie Lou at 3 PM the day before. And remember, we know that she was alive and well when that phone call took place sometime between seven and 8 PM that night. The problem here is at some point, Jerry's story will change. Oh, how convenient. And he will later say that he was last at the house at 8 p.m. the night before. The problem here with honing in immediately on Jerry Fleck is that we have two other characters that are all tied into this story. So two persons, two men, gave... Evie Lou a ride to her home the day before she was found. So were they friends of hers, family members of hers, maybe coworkers? I don't know who these people were in relationship to Evie Lou, but I do know this. She was not working at the time. She was collecting a, I believe it was a disability check at this time. These two men, what we do know, so police are aware of these two individuals And we know that they gave her a ride to her home, which was located at 276 Main Street there in South Shore. And the way that the police have worded this is that the last evening that Evie Lou was alive acquainted her with three suspects, two of them being the men that gave her a ride to her home. And the third being her estranged husband, who, as we already pointed out, has a shaky alibi. So his alibi, his story for the 20th changes. The men that gave her a ride, I'm unclear as to what their story is. That information has never, to my knowledge, been released to the public of what their statements are, their movements, when they last saw her why they were with her that evening. But we do know that it's confirmed that they gave her a ride. That's, they they admit to that. People had witnessed them give her a ride. She did have a vehicle. She had a small Pinto at the time. Classic. Classic, that's right. Jerry, we should point out, her estranged husband was driving a black truck at the time. His statements were that he was working on a vehicle, helping somebody in their garage, working on a vehicle. The time, the timing of it seems very strange. It would be a little late at night, in my opinion, to be working on a vehicle. But if he had to work all day that day, maybe that was the only opportunity that he had to help out a friend. And then he says, well, then afterward, I went home to my mom's house and went to bed. Well, first off, like I've always said, if the person is very close to you and they're your alibi, don't buy it. Not going to believe it. Show me some other proof. I mean, I'm going to put it into account. I'm going to hear them out. But I don't think it's that strange as far as the time of day because, like you said, did he work during the day and he couldn't go over to his buddy to help him out till a certain time and Also, did they run into some kind of snag and a job that they thought would take maybe an hour took a few hours? Or did they have a couple too many to drink and they just decided to sit around and bullshit? We don't don't know. But I don't think Jerry Jerry Dingleberry has a solid alibi, in my opinion. No, not at all. And one thing that you got working in favor of your investigation is our timeline. So Jerry is being interviewed by police She's found at 10 a.m. that morning. They're interviewing him minutes 
or within an hour or two later. So when, when I'm sitting across from a guy and he tells me a, a, one story of, oh, the last time I saw her was, or last time I was at the house was 3 p.m. yesterday, and then that changes to 8 p.m. yesterday, I'm going, wait a second, you've not even had enough time to really forget yesterday's events. Why are they so, why do you need to change your story? And there I start to wonder, did was something said to him by police that made him have to change his story or did somebody see his truck at the house at an hour when he said he wasn't there? Well, that's a great point because like you said, we don't have any eyewitnesses or ear witnesses that we know of to this crime, but in a neighborhood like this neighbors would maybe go, well, you know, I, I didn't hear anything. I didn't see anything that was abnormal, but I do know her husband that, yeah, they could be separated or whatever, but I do know the husband's vehicle was there and it was dark out or whatever. This would be a situation where if her car's already there and these guys that give her a ride, so you assume there's a second vehicle there or Jerry coming and going from the house, there would be a second vehicle there at times the day before. But here's where I'm confused, and maybe you can clear this up. I know I'm not the smartest guy on the block. But um, if he's telling the cops, hey, I was at my friend's house helping him fix a vehicle, but then he then changes his story and says, well, I was actually at my house or my former house with my wife at 8 p.m. See where I'm confused? No, I see why you're confused. I'm confused by the timeline, too, because while we have this information that these two guys gave her a ride, we don't have a time for that. Right. The the only thing, the only real true time marker we have is that movie that she discussed what movie she was planning to watch. We know what time the movie started. We know what time it ended. We know that she did not have that phone call after the movie was over. So that's really the only great markers we get on our timeline. The problem I have with Jerry's story is his 8 p.m. marker is lining up real nice with the 8 p.m. marker of that movie starting and after the phone call took place. We have nobody saying that they made contact with her after that movie started. Correct. It would seem that all everyone's stories are lining up with the last known contact that she had with someone would have been that 8 p.m. marker. Where we do end up with a witness is after the fact. So Jerry calls Evie Lou's house three times the morning that she was found dead under the refrigerator. On one of these calls, on the third and final call, the paramedic that was responding to the emergency call picks up the phone and informs Jerry Fleck that his wife has been killed. Question for you. Do you think that these calls were legitimate calls or is this a way to pretend you don't know what happened? It's really too difficult to say. I lean toward the, you know me, Captain, I think everybody's guilty. I lean toward the idea that this is trying to create that alibi to further that alibi of, oh, I was just trying to get a hold of her. Oh, I was just trying to talk. I needed to call her about this, that, or the other thing. And oh my God, she's dead. Right. That's where that's where my mind goes to. Now, I've had several people tell me that where his mother's home was situated, you could from from most windows in that the front of that house, you could view the highway and that that highway would be necessary for police and paramedics to take that route to get to Evie Lou's house. So the assumption that several people, several local people have made is that if Jerry did this, maybe he's nervous. He can't go back to the house. He can't, he can't return to that home. Somebody else has to find this body. But did he sit at the window and watch and wait till he saw police cars, an ambulance traveling down that road to get to her home? And then, then... No one then. All of a sudden, the phone calls are happening from his mother's house to Evie Lou's house. Again, if that if he's responsible and it played out that way, 
he sees the cars. Now he's going, oh, I'm the, I'm the smartest cat in the room. And I'm going to make some phone calls and th- they're going to know that I'm just as shocked as they are. I couldn't have done it. I, it was a total surprise to me. I was expecting her to pick up the phone. Okay, let me see if you can pick up what I'm putting down. If I'm an investigator, and I'm not saying that this is definitive evidence, but you were talking about maybe this murderer, the crime takes place in the bedroom. There's some kind of panic, goes to move the body. Because of the panic, just leaves her on the porch, decides to try to cover up. Is it a cover up with the items being thrown onto her, or is it a continuation of the attack, a tini- a continuation to try to destroy this victim. But where my head leans towards is we go, well, we got these two guys that dropped her off. And when there's some confusion and things that don't make sense at the crime scene, well, if there was two attackers, that could make the confusion. It could certainly make the confusion. And one thing, look, we say drop her off or gave her a ride to her home. It's very likely that both of those individuals went into the home with her. So another thing that complicates the case is that there's no sign of forced entry into the home. And again, I don't know what police's thoughts, what the police's thoughts are on these three individuals other than they have openly said that her movements of that last evening alive acquainted her with three suspects and they, they don't name them. They simply say the two men that gave her a ride to her home and her estranged husband, they've been very tight lipped about this case because my conversation with them is this case is very solvable. We got to keep this information close to the vest. So when they do release information like this, where they are openly, they're openly naming suspects without naming suspects, right? Right. You describe the person. We, we know who the husband is so that we can put a name to that. That's Jerry Fleck. The two men that gave her a ride. I don't know their names other than I've been told one of them's last name is Blankenship. So these three people are all known to the police and their investigation has led them to believe believe within this group of three that we have your your perpetrator. Well, it's interesting because I think law enforcement's strategy here is, hey, well, we'll tell you, we're looking at these three individuals. And by telling the public that, maybe somebody will come forward and go, well, I heard these two guys talking about this time they drove this woman home and attacked her or whatever. Or I know these two guys that took her home and they're not good guys and I can prove that. But what's difficult here is with these three possible suspects, you go, well, Jerry, Jerry Dingleberry, if there's no break in to the house, well, that's not a big deal because he was just living there five days ago. So it's reasonable to believe that he still has access to come and go as he pleases to the property maybe without her knowing that he still has access to enter and exit at his will. It's also reasonable to believe that these two individuals that were giving her a ride home, that maybe she let them in the house or maybe they forced their way into the house, but there's no sign of break in. Yeah. I believe that they, if they would have forced their way into the home, likely we would have something that's suggestive of that. Again, we, you review these cases and it's like, you can't say everybody locks their doors. Everybody locks their windows. And some homes are certainly more easy to get to access than others. Right. So that gets a little wonky, but what, what we have here, captain, I get, I paint a picture the way that, that if I were to Bob Ross, this thing out and paint a picture of how I think this whole thing went down, there were a couple people that have told me very close without naming names, very close to the case, very close to the victim said that they not only heard rumors that Jerry, the strange husband, was keeping an eye on his wife, watching her, watching the house, at least one says that they have proof that he was doing this. Right. And one bit of evidence that we have that we haven't gone through yet is they found in an ashtray inside the home, they found three different brands of cigarettes. And we've talked about this before on the show and people that 
are smokers, especially long-term smokers, will know a lot of people are pretty loyal to their brand. They find some, they find a, a brand that they like, and they they will regularly smoke that kind of cigarette. There were three different brands found in the ashtray within her home. That to me is suggestive that she invited these two guys into the home and that the three of them were inside this house together for a period of time, long enough to smoke some cigarettes. Evie Lou was a smoker. So we can go ahead and say that one of those brands found was Evie Lou's. Yeah, we could deduce. It's very likely with two other brands being there that we had two other persons inside that home at one point on the 20th. But it's possible that they dropped her off, had a cigarette with her, and they left. Because we do have this phone call, and to me that phone call suggests that she was by herself. But could be wrong. According to, yes, according to the information available, she doesn't reference that anybody else is there with her at that time. That doesn't mean that the house is empty. But then going back to the whole no sign of forced entry, we do know based on the information available that Jerry Fleck went to the hardware store days before the murder and had a second key made for that house. Now, mind you, he's not staying there at that time, but for some reason he needs to have a second key made where that key goes, who it's supposed to go to. If it's going to be his key, I cannot say that. What I can say is multiple people said this man had a key made at the hardware store for the house that that woman was murdered in. Yeah, but a clever cat, right? Hey, I'm going to go get a second key made, and then I'm going to go to my wife. Hey, I know we're splitting up. I'm going to go stay at my mom's. And all oh, by the way, I'm returning my key to you without her knowledge that he has a second key made. And I'm not saying that's definitive evidence, but to me, that is evidence of something, right? That's evidence that he wanted access to this house whenever he wanted to, and he didn't essentially want her to know. But because she is dead, we don't know if he had these keys made and and she knew about it. Well, according to his, again, shaky alibi, that's the words used by investigators who would know far better than us. But they are stating that In one story, he says that he left the home about 3 p.m. on the 20th, this after shoveling snow and dropping off groceries to the house. If he's dropping off groceries, if he's helping to still maintain the property in the house, would make sense that he has a key. Did he he give that information to police? That's something I would want to know, because if he tried to withhold that information from police and investigators, well, that makes it look all that more shady. But the picture that I would I would paint here if we if we were talking back to bob ross if we were talking crime fiction right we're working on a crime fiction story a novel crime novel yeah we could paint the picture of one person is responsible for this murder evie lou was a smaller woman a petite woman if the two men that let's say they drop her off they go into the home with her and we again we have the cigarette evidence that says Maybe they went into the house and maybe they openly told police. Yeah, we went into the house for an hour or two, had a couple drinks or whatever. But for her to have those, I, when I hear scrapes and cuts on the, on the feet, that to me is suggestive that someone had to drag her from that bed and attempted to get her outside. I think I'll just throw it out there. If he wants to come at me, he can come at me. I think that that Jerry was watching the house, was watching his wife, saw her with these two men at some point, saw the two men go into the home. They're in there for a period of time, and he was too sh- he was too chicken shit to confront her in the moment when those men were there. And then he waited until they weren't there anymore, and maybe she had gone to bed using his second key that he had made. He went into that home. He killed her in that bed. He tried to get rid of the body. But guess what? It was blizzard conditions. And he he drug her from the bed to the kitchen door, which led to the backyard, and attempted to get her outside and probably into the bed of his truck, where he would drive that body and dump it somewhere or conceal it somewhere or maybe bury it for good. But we got frozen ground out there. 
I think something stopped him, prevented him from carrying out that plan, and that he panicked in the moment, found the old refrigerator, pushed it over on top of her, threw another item on her, and then he left. He fled the scene. Maybe maybe it was just as simple as he was worried that somebody would see his truck there now that he had killed somebody. But I think that he attempted to hide the body, was unsuccessful, panicked, and then sat, went home, sat by the window, and watched and waited for emergency personnel to respond to the scene and try to further his alibi by making phone calls to the home while they were there. Well, I think everything you're saying is reasonable, but we don't have we don't have the autopsy. We don't have these photos. So we don't, when we hear this, these terms scrapes and cuts where my mind goes to is, was she trying to defend herself? And when she was on the bed, was she trying to use her feet at some point? And that's how she got these cuts and scrapes. There is some other information out there. And this is this, I want to throw out there and, and be perfectly honest. This is something that we could not, back up. I'm going to put it out there because it was told to us, but we cannot 100% confirm this information. I would, I would wager a Franklin on it that police (laughs) know if this is true or not. How much money do you owe people? Well, I keep winning. So it doesn't, it's not, you don't have to have a whole lot of money. If you, if you just keep recycling (laughs) that same Franklin and doubling, doubling up double or nothing. Okay. Then so no forced entry into the home, but there is information out there that says that anywhere from 500 to possibly up to $800 cash was missing from the home as well. And what's interesting about that little bit of information is, again, we don't know 100% sure that this is true, but I would bet you the police know if that's fact or fiction. But we also don't have anything else that's ever named in the papers or any report out there that some the the items were missing from the home. And the reason why I bring that up is it's cash, man. It's cash. Cash comes and goes without without a whole lot of checks and balances and a whole lot of record keeping, right? When this case broke, what did the estranged husband do? He pointed to the first husband. Would there be anybody that would want to harm? Do you know anybody that would want to harm Evie Lou? Oh, yeah, her her first husband. You want to take a look at that guy. You might want to give him a call. Who are they going to talk to to figure out if anything is missing from this home? Nobody lives there but Evie Lou and her estranged husband, who's been outdoors now for five, six days, depending on who you talk to. He might be the one that's going through the home and saying, Oh, by the way, officers, we had X amount of cash in the house, or I know she had X amount of cash in the house, and now it's gone. Again, pointing out the possibility, planting the seed in the detective's mind that, well, maybe this was a robbery. Maybe somebody was after that money, and that's why she got killed. If you saw something, say something. If you know something, say something. It's possible that one of these three suspects has told somebody something about this crime. If you know anything, please contact law enforcement. I agree 100% here, Captain. I believe that the Kentucky State Police are fully under the idea that whoever is responsible for this has said something to someone in the last 30 years. And if that someone is you, you can help. KSP is strongly encouraging anyone who has information that could help solve this cold case to contact officers who are investigating this case. All information will be kept in the strictest of confidence and diligently pursued by the investigators. Any of the investigating officers may be contacted by calling the Kentucky State Police Ashland Post at 606-928-6600.
888-646-6421. want to thank everybody for joining us here in the garage each and every week. Can't thank you enough. Colonel, do we have any recommended reading for the beautiful listeners? This week we are recommending The Day My Mother Never Came Home by Reginald L. Reed Jr. In this book, this fantastic book, Reed invites you into his journey of healing and the pursuit of justice. With raw vulnerability, he delves into the depths of his trauma, offering glimpses into the psychological impact on his life, while also offering a powerful message of hope and resilience. This is not just another true crime tale. This is a testament to the power of the human spirit and the importance of shedding light on the truth. Check out The Day My Mother Never Came Home. I was lucky enough to have a discussion with author Reginald Reed a while back on our other show, Off the Record, so check that out as well. You can find this wonderful recommendation as well as many more on our recommended page at our website, truecrimegarage.com. And until next week, be good, be kind, and don't litter. Explore today's must-have trends and innovative styles at Mrs. B's Clearance and Outlet. Shop one-of-a-kind finds in today's must-have trends. Explore wall-to-wall deals, furniture, flooring, mattresses, home accents, seasonal favorites, and more. Discover unique new home decor, pillows, accessories, and more. There's something perfect for your style and budget. There's new inventory every day at up to 80% off suggested retail. Discover the style and savings of Mrs. B's Clearance and Outlet. 